I'm here with Sean O'Neill. Um, he's here to join my show today. Thank you so much. Good to be here with you, Kevin. Okay. Um, how are you doing so far? Pretty good. Pretty good. Keeping busy. Yeah. All right, so let's start with the first question. Um, so being a five-time U.S. national men's champion uh, and three-time Olympian for Team USA, can you please share with us like some of your best memories? Um, Two-time Olympian, although I have coached in three Paralympics, so I've kind of gotten a little bit of experience on, on both sides of the kind of the barrier. Um, I would probably say as an athlete, the most exciting part of playing in the Seoul, which was the first Olympics for table tennis, and then um, also working with the athletes in um, London, um, I would probably say getting to meet as many athletes in other sports. In table tennis, we see everyone kind of every weekend when you're on the national team, even internationally, if you're going to world championships or Pan Ams, you see a lot of the same people. But I think in the Olympics themselves, because it's a multi-sport event, getting to meet people, whether they're in archery and fencing and track and field, learning about their sports. Sometimes you'll have an experience, for instance, I remember in Barcelona, I had a lot of difficulty using the washing machine. It was the first time and I couldn't figure out where you put the soap. And it turned out that the soap was built in. And the guy who was helping me, his name was Jim Courier. He was one of the top tennis players in the US. And he was very short. And I thought he was a much taller person. So I didn't realize it till I saw his name tag. So you find a lot of kind of new friendships, um, new situations. Um, as a coach, it's always wonderful, especially with our Paralympic team, to work with the athletes. Um, these guys are the most inspirational athletes you can be around. And it really kind of puts you into a better frame of mind when you start to complain about little things. Um, just going to the tra training venue, if you have a team of, let's say six people, we've got like two or three wheelchairs and the other teams have lined up, the bus can only hold six wheelchairs and you see like 30 wheelchairs in front of you. Things that you wouldn't take for granted or that you do take for granted, you have to be much more planning, much more preparation. And I think that presenting new points of view, especially within the table tennis community, I think the Paralympics has probably taught me the most. Oh, I remember one time you told me like, uh, you're playing ping pong with like the basketball team at one of the Olympics. Yeah, I mean, the, the probably in 92, um, that's when the dream team was there. So you had Michael Jordan, Christian Leitner, um, Scotty Pippen, Patrick Ewing. And I can remember talking to Charles Barkley because the two best ping pong players were Christian Leitner and Michael Jordan. They're both from North Carolina, so they have a big rivalry. And they would always be playing on the ping pong table in their hotel. They wouldn't stay in the village because they would just get bombarded if they went to the village, the dining hall or just around town. So I had a chance to speak with Charles Barkley, who was at Sports Med. And um, I was asking him if he wanted any tips to try to beat Michael or Leitner. And he was like, man, those guys are so much better. He goes, I can never beat any of them. So kind of fun to be around other athletes. The one thing I would say is that I didn't find one Olympic athlete that ever degraded or downplayed the athleticism needed to be good in table tennis. They gave table tennis full respect, whether it was soccer, basketball, track and field, everyone was like kind of in awe of what table tennis players do. So it was kind of a nice feeling to know that while sometimes in the media, people think, oh, it's just ping pong, but the athletes at the Olympic level, they all recognize what a great sport it is. Right, yeah, that's nice. Like outside of like, like people who don't play the sport, like they always, look down on it well the, the, the thing is it's so easy to play i mean it, it's like saying like somebody who's just in running well that's an easy sport because everyone can run well yeah but to run faster to have the precision it takes to play at the highest level i think that's what the other olympians understand and i think most olympians if you could show them another sport that would be easier to qualify they'd probably seriously consider taking it up but they're always like well-trained in their own. So it's not like at age 30, they're gonna say like, well, table tennis is easy, so I'm gonna to change to that. Um, if you've played a sport and you're gonna make it to that level internationally, you've probably put in at least 15 years. So um, it, it is a kind of a nice family to be around. And if you see, and you make, if you're fortunate to, to make multiple times, you get to see a lot of familiar faces. Right. So as a player, um, you have achieved so many like awards and recognitions. Uh, which one are you proud of the most? 
Um, I would probably say the one medal that stands out the most would be probably in 1991, we had the Pan Ams in Cuba. And at the time there was very kind of frosty relations between the US and Cuba. And I was playing mixed doubles with Diana G who had been my longtime mixed doubles partner. And in the finals, we played against a Cuban team. And there was a lot of talk and discussion that Fidel Castro, who was the um, leader of Cuba, the president would be there that evening. So there was about, I would say close to 6,000 people and the temperature in the gym, cause there was no AC was at least 105. And being in that situation where every time you won a point, it was dead silent. And every time the opponent won a point, you had 6,000 people screaming at the top of their lungs. Um, at the end of the match, we managed to get through, I think we might've even saved a couple of match points um, to go onto the podium to have the American flag shown and then to um, have to play the national anthem on Cuban soil was was pretty amazing. So um, a lot of very fond memories, um, the team event, doubles, singles, um, being a coach. Um, I think from a coaching perspective, it was most likely when Tal Leibovitz won a bronze medal in Athens and to see the two other countries flags go up and then the US flag go up um, was very meaningful. So I think th those are the memories that I, I cherish the most. But really the biggest thing, it wasn't just one thing, it was kind of starting at age eight and getting involved and having good coaches and then still being involved some 37 years later. So um, I really am very fortunate to be able to um, have a career in a sport that I really love. Right. It must have been like super nerve wracking, like when like um, you've won a point and then like dead silence, like no one even clapping or was there your coaches too? <laughs> I mean, the coaches try to clap, but there's such a difference in the sound level. Yeah. I mean, it just sounded like a plane was going overhead every time that they won a point. Right. And it was so hot and wet. There was one instance during that match where I missed my serve twice in a row. And people were like, what's going on? Well, I could literally put my hand above my head and just water was running down my elbow. It right. looked like, a, looked like um, outside of your house when it's raining and you have the um, overhang. So it was so hot. Everyone was like just so close to the table. And um, thank God that my mixed doubles partner, Diana G, um, had a lot of patience because I don't know if I could have handled if she had missed two of her serves. But <laughs> we, got, we got through the match. And um, it's those type of... Um, memories that really stick with you when you go into like a tough situation, whether it's a tough tournament, whether it's a tough finals, you look to those kind of as experience to say, okay, well, I've, I've actually dealt with something similar. Right. Like has the ball like slipped, like when you hit it before? Or? I mean, you, Diana had short pips. So when oh, it's so okay. humid and wet, if she pushed it and she didn't have the perfect angle, which would be more like perpendicular. If she opened it, it would just slip and go right over her head. Wow. So, I mean, it was like a battle of kind of like playing tennis conditions where it's like really hot and humid and slippery. So we had to make adjustments. And um, I think I went through per match, like maybe four to six shirts per match. I mean, just walking in, you were drenched because it was so hot inside. Yeah. Um, Insa Bushan, who won the women's singles, had dehydration and had to be rushed um, to the hospital afterwards because it was just unbearable heat um, in August in Havana um, in a very tiny um, coliseum with just too many people. Right. Uh, so when and how did you start playing table tennis? Um, I got involved. Um, our, my father was an active player in USA table tennis tournaments when he was a cadet and coming from the Midwest, he was one of the top players in his region. And because they really didn't have a rating system they have like a committee um, i think most of the committee people were from the east coast and midwest so his ranking was really high and he always had a good table in the basement he had butterfly equipment i can still remember he had shriver on his forehand and backhand a couple of paddles and when the chinese came to maryland it was coalfield house i want to say 1972 for ping pong diplomacy we went and saw them play and i can vividly remember george braithwaite as one of the players who played for Team USA, because later on I got to play doubles with him and even coached me in some of my finals at the Nationals, I'm at the US Open. So being exposed to ping pong diplomacy kind of got our family thinking about, hey, this is still kind of cool. My dad 
wasn't that old. He loved to play. And we found out about a local table tennis club called the Northern Virginia Table Tennis Club. And as an eight and nine year old, I would spend every Tuesday night and Friday night. They were only open two days a week from seven till 10. And I would play with the adults. And I mean, it was just a blast for me to hang out with all the old timers who really treated me well. And as I improved, they all gave me a lot of encouragement. And probably the biggest step was my parents allowing me to go both to Minnesota as a nine-year-old to be taught by three players from Thailand. And then I guess it was when I was 11 for my parents to also to allow me to go to Sweden to play in the um, Swedish junior programs there um, for six weeks during the school year. So that's what really propelled me into taking it more from a high performance or kind of a national league, national level type of mindset. Oh, did your parents uh, go of you like to Minnesota? Or no, did you no, that was that was the craziness. Um, they sent me to Minnesota in the summer of 76 with three guys that were 27 years old. Oh. And they're like, okay, see you in six weeks. And I play table tennis about six to eight hours a day at the um, Disney's Table Tennis Club in Minneapolis. And I made some wonderful friends with the players there. And then after the US Open in 1978, this sweet Stockholm club called Angby, they brought their team over to the US Open. And the head of Angby, his name is Nisa Sandberg, he saw that both Scott Butler and myself were a little bit stronger in the cadet division and mini cadets. And he asked both of us if they if we'd like to come and play in Stockholm for his club. And Scott said, sure. So he went from, I want to say, September, October, November for six weeks. And then I went January, February, March for six weeks. And that really opened up my eyes to see kind of how the sport is taken seriously in Europe. And then both Scott and I and the rest of the junior team went to China in 1982 for two months. So right. being exposed and playing a lot of international matches and tournaments and trainings um, is really critical if you want to play internationally. When you uh, train with the players from Thailand, like was it hard to communicate or did they know how to speak English well? Their English was pretty good. It was mostly training camps. So it was me with 30 other players. I, I know that when I went to Minneapolis, my rating was 636. It'll still stay with me. And when I came back after the following tournament, I went over 1500. So it was just total immersion. I mean, we would be running and that was the biggest difference. They added physical fitness. So from the age of eight turning nine, we would run a minimum of four miles a day, two in the morning, two in the afternoon, and there'd be two camps. There'd be a morning and afternoon camp, and there'd be an evening clinic. And in each one of those, there's physical training every day. And it was going up steps in this around this lake where there are like maybe 100 steps, and you have to go up like a frog. And then calisthenics, stretching. Um, they had learned from the Japanese, and the Japanese were very big on off-the-table training. So um, I just thought that was the normal thing. So from grade school on, I would always run a couple miles before school in the morning um, because that's just how I thought that you were supposed to um, prepare to be a good table tennis player. Uh, as a player, did you face any difficulty in your table tennis journey? Yeah, I mean, I would think like literally every tournament, there's going to be challenges and problems. Um, I can remember one U.S. Open in Las Vegas where I was playing in the boys under 15 final and I pulled a pretty serious muscle in my leg and I didn't think I would be able to finish the match. And one of the coaches said, you know, at least stand there and try. And somehow, some way, I got extremely lucky. My opponent realized I couldn't move. I was just standing there. So they toned down their game and they just played control. And that kept me in the game and I was a very good pusher because at our club in Northern Virginia, we had like 12 choppers. So I learned how to push very effectively off the sides and even to flat hit a little bit. So in that particular match, I was up two to zero when the injury occurred. And then it was quickly two to two. And I thought to myself, okay, um, this isn't too good. But then all of a sudden I was up 14 to six. And I thought, okay, I've weathered the storm. This is going to actually work out. And then all of a sudden I was down 16 to 14. And I, so, I mean, it was just back and forth, good luck, bad luck. And in the end, it turned out I won the match. And then the following day, I decided to give the under 18 a try. And I won the, the juniors under 18, basically on one leg. So those type of experiences build confidence. They allow you to realize that, you know, if you can do it in this situation, next time something comes up, maybe you can look back and say, you know what, there's still a chance. There's still a way. Um, playing in the Olympic tryouts in 88, 
both in the quarterfinals and in the semis. I was trailing two games to one against very good players, Danny C. Miller and Horatio Pintea. And that's not the situation you want to be in as you're trying to qualify for the Olympics is playing people that are your equal or maybe even slightly better than you, and they're leading. Um, but through a lot of support with a boy that lived at my house from Thailand, his name is Hank Tikavarikit. He acted as my coach in that particular match, figured out a way of getting through those and making the team in 88. But I would say literally every national men's singles, the mixed doubles, the men's doubles, there's always little hurdles. Um, there's always little things. And the one thing that I took away with it, took away from it is be a good contingency planner. Before you go to any tournament, write down or think of all the things that could go wrong and figure out what plans you would have to deal with them so that when they do happen, it's not a shock. You don't go into a frenzy. One other example, in the 88 Olympic tryouts, I knew because I was using Chinese rubber on my forehand that it had a tendency to bubble. And if you do a heavy loop and you just hit it in the wrong angle, the pips would detach from the sponge and it makes the rubber unplayable. And it happened enough in practice where I had pre-cut, I think like six sheets of rubber, pre-glued them, had them in my bag in case something happened during the tournament. Well, during my first match in the Olympic trials, I'm warming up with a very good player. His name is Brian Masters. He was a Pan Am gold medal single champion from the US. My rubber bubbles in warm up. And I'm like thinking, okay, um, I mentioned to the referee, I'd like to get my towel, go over to grab my towel. I rip the sheet of rubber off my paddle, throw the pre-glued rubber on the bracket, go back, put on the table, sit on it for like maybe six seconds and went on to win the match. Now I know if I hadn't pre-planned that that could have occurred, the normal thing would be my hair would have been on fire. I would have been like, what's going on? Here's the Olympic tryouts. First match, I don't even get to play a point. And in warm up, I've bubbled up. I mean, it's a perfect excuse to give, but if you're trying to make a team, you really don't have room for excuses. You've got to figure out a solution. So the one lesson, always plan for something going wrong. Expect the best, but plan for the worst. Um, you can't control a lot of things. You can't control your opponent's training. You can't control if they're going to get a lucky shot or if they're going to be on the best game of their life. You can only control what you can. So those are the areas that I think it's critical for all players to kind of do a stock kind of list of what things could go wrong. Do I have a backup paddle? What if my shoes aren't grippy? What if I have a bad draw? What if I have a good draw? If you can go through those things before the tournament, personally, I find that I'm much more relaxed when I know I have backup plans because um, crazy things do happen. Um, we've had times where there's no air conditioning. Um, in the hall in India in 1987, it's like an open air arena and birds were flying over. And you can imagine if a bird's flying over your table, what's the one thing that can occur? Well, all of a sudden you look at your racket and you've got something that needs cleaning up. And it's like, at that point, you either like lose it or you laugh it off and say, you know, hey, this is expected. So there's a lot, lot of little things. And I believe that our sport, at least at the kind of the regional, national, international experience really factors in. So the more tournaments, the more situations you can find yourself in, the more experience you can draw from. Okay. Um, being one of the top junior players uh, in the U.S. at a young age, are there any like experiences that you would like to share with the young players now? Yeah, I think one thing that for me, I was really, really fortunate because I had a rival with Scott Butler. Um, everyone has heard about Jimmy Butler as he won his fourth nationals after taking off a huge break, but I was much more um, competitive with his older brother um, when I started the sport. Um, we were both the same age. Um, we played in the boys under 11 finals like two times, the 13s like three times, the 15s like four times, the 18s like five times. So, and also I, Jimmy being younger, when Scott and I were 15, I think Jimmy was probably like 10 or 11. And in the age divisions, there's a big difference between a 15 year old and a 10 year old. So um, my most tough memories or fond memories, like they kind of go hand in hand. It's just Scott and I trading back and forth. He would win an under 11s, then I would win the under 11s. Then he would win the under 13s and I would win the under 13s. And we just went back and forth. And if you ever watched any of the matches and we, the way they had us play was before men's singles, they would have our match right before. So we were kind of like center stage. And in a match, 
you just look at one of our faces. One of us would be crying, usually like by the third or fourth game. And then you could see who was winning. And then the next time we would play, the other one would be crying right in the middle of the match. Or if the TV cameras went to us during the coaching break, you could just see like a sense of despair on our face. And um, Scott's been such a wonderful friend as we got older, kind of left the competitive nature. When my dad passed away, he came to um, the wake in North Carolina. So looking back while we were so competitive and it was like the O'Neills against the Butlers back and forth. And when Scott went to college, then Jimmy took his place and I had to battle with Jimmy. Um, it's really lent itself to some pretty amazing friendships. And I still keep in touch with Jimmy on a weekly basis. So um, junior table tennis is a lot of fun. I know it's very stressful for a lot of kids because the pressure that the parents put on. Um, but my motto when I played in the juniors was, don't worry about the losses, just fight to try to win as many championships as possible. Um, if you lose in the finals, you are one step closer than you might've been if you'd run, in it, run into the top seed in the semis or in the quarter. So don't get too hung up on the individual matches. Just do your best to um, try to the top results as possible. And also don't focus on the rating. If you're gonna focus on your rating, as a player, you're almost gone because the rating is a, is a snapshot of what has happened. You also need to be looking forward at where you're trying to go and what players you would like to beat or what, what rounds of the tournament you'd like to get to. It's really about championships. Um, so if I could give one tip to every parent, every kid, if you focus on your ratings more than maybe thir 13 seconds a month, that's probably 12 too much think about what you're doing because the results are there on the paper. The rating just says how you did against the players in that tournament. And they could be improving fast because your ratings higher really doesn't mean anything because it's still a race. You're still trying to compete with the um, players around the country. Okay. So like when you were younger, like um, were you and Scott like still close friends or? It was weird because um, we would do a lot of things together at the tournaments and often we do things together after our match and it was such a big buildup. I mean, there was Eric Bogan was playing Danny Seamiller or a guy named DJ Lee was playing Danny Seamiller and I was gonna be center stage and 15 minutes before the men's singles final, Scott and I are battling it and you've got people cheering for each of us, um, kind of like the seniors and the hall of famers are like placing bets and they're like trying to give us tips before the match. You know, Sean, you need to play more to his forehand, stay away from his backhand, it's so good. and. After we'd play, because we're just kids, we'd go to, it was in Las Vegas, we'd go to Circus Circus and watch the shows there or MGM and get like candy and do things and like do the photo booth. So we had a lot of fun, but going into the matches, it just seemed like everyone added extra layers of pressure because they'd all say like, Scott, you won it last year. Sean, do you think you can beat them? And then the next tournament we'd play and it'd be just the opposite where I'd come in as the, the favorite and then I would lose and then he would come in. So it, it was such a great rivalry because it kept us thinking in every practice throughout the six months before, because we'd play in the finals of the US Open and then we'd play in the finals of the US Nationals. It was July and December. So um, if, if you were to ask me the one thing that helped me the most as a player, I had great coaches, I had great family support, but having a rival like Scott, who when he was 12 years old, he was already over 20, 2250 and he was getting into the, I remember he made the top four of the Nissan Open in the men's singles as a 12 year old. And that's who I had to face. And then, I mean, coming out of the juniors, we always had Danny Seamiller and Eric Bogan and they were top 20 players in the world. So, I mean, it's always like, who's your competition? And the higher the level of your competition, the easier it is for you to improve. While at the same time, you have to be able to beat everyone below you. It's not enough to upset two or three people above you, you need to beat everyone below you because they're chasing you as well. So junior junior ranks, I owe just a ton of um, thanks to Scott Butler because um, he helped raise the bar every week in practice for me. All right. So when you were younger, did you have any like role models either in table tennis or in general? Yeah, I would say um, because I lived in the Washington DC area, I followed the football team there and the basketball team. And at my first camp that I went to in that summer of 76 in Minnesota with the three guys from Thailand, the Montreal Olympics were on. And I can remember watching Bruce Jenner win the decathlon. And I thought that was pretty amazing. And that kind of made me think, gosh, 
it would be so cool if one day table tennis went into the Olympics because in 1976, there was no table tennis. And then we kind of got word around 79, 80 that there was a chance. And then I want to say in 83, it looked really promising when Korea got the Olympics because they were going to ask to put it in. Um, and then we had the Pan Am Games in 83, which is usually a precursor. You always go to the Pan Ams, then the Olympics, because that's the pathway. And I made the 83 Pan Am team as a 15-year-old. So I was just really lucky because timing-wise, I was among the top amateur players in the U.S. And there was a big discussion for the Olympics. Do they even allow professional players? Because you, in most sports, you couldn't be a professional. In basketball, you can only be college. You, it couldn't be dream team. And um, the ITTF, with a lot of smart thinking, they said, we're going to let everyone play in the Olympics. So all the pro players in Europe, the pro Chinese, everyone could play. So timing-wise, it really fit into my growth to um, be very competitive as like an 18, 19-year-old for Seoul. Um, but I, I think that going, going back to kind of the earlier time, I mean, it, it was just working really hard, just trying to stay focused. I mean, I didn't go to any high school dances. I didn't do any other sports. I would have loved to have played basketball, um, but I was pretty much three to five hours a day, table tennis, five to five days a week. And then on the weekends, I would play six, six hours a day. So, I mean, it was pretty much full-time table tennis. And um, the coaches that I had for my initial ones in Thailand, in Minnesota, one of those coaches moved into my family's house um, a year later, going to Sweden, moving out to the Olympic Training Center. Um, I've been very blessed just to have great coaches from day one and to be around some pretty amazing players as well. And you can always pick things up from players as, as much as coaches. And then um, just having a good support team around me as well. So being a coach for a long time, what are your best and worst experiences? experiences ever? I would say um, best experience is like basically every time I do a lesson because there's a chance to teach somebody something new and then all of a sudden they leave the lesson and they're just like, they can't wait to play matches. They're all excited. They want to play a tournament. They're just really revved up. That type of feeling I get every time I do a lesson. I mean, there's always something within the lesson where it makes me excited because I see the player get excited. The toughest thing are the losses. Um, because you're fighting so hard. I would say that the toughest loss was probably in Beijing in the um, Paralympics with Tal Leibovitz. He was playing against a player who he had beaten before. And when he went into the match, he got into a little bit of an argument with one of the fans. The fan was cheering for a player from Finland and he was drunk. And tall as he was winning points and he went Cho, then the fan got involved and they were going back and forth. And I didn't have an effective way to refocus tall, to think about, let's play the point. Let's not try to like out Cho the drunk guy up in the stands because it's very easy to get distracted when somebody's being so loud and boisterous while you're actually playing in a critical match. And um, along those same lines, tall played for the bronze medal in the world championships in the open class against a great player from um, Poland who I had played against. So I had played him in the world championships in 1989. His name is Stanislav Freicek. Great player, has wins over Waldner, beat all the top players in Europe, just a tremendous career. But when I beat him, he was probably in his late 30s, maybe 40s, and he was playing tall for the bronze medal. Paul was up 7-4 in the fifth game and was so nervous and he was rushing. And I took a timeout and said, you've got to slow down. You've got to slow down. But Tall was thinking, I've got to sprint to the finish line. And the last, I would say six or seven points of the game, Tall played in about 40 seconds. He was just wanting, and he lost the match. And afterwards, Freichek came over and he, he had the medal around his neck. And this is a bronze at the world championships. And he was like, hey, you should be owning this, but you just played so fast. You didn't give yourself 
time to think about what was going on. Well, it was really just a case of nerves. You just wanted to win. And as a coach, that was particularly painful because I thought that the timeout that I called earlier was enough to slow things down to just say, hey, you're in control. You're up 7-4. Things are going fine. Let's just play it one point at a time. And instead, it actually probably did the opposite. It probably set Tall into a, a tailspin knowing that, oh my gosh, I'm this close from winning the, a world medal. I mean, this is the most recent world medal. And this was in the um, Paralympic or the Para World Championships in Switzerland. I want to say it was probably in probably 2000, 2006, possibly. Um, so that was such a painful because we were so close to winning that match. And the entire team, Mitch Seidenfeld, Andre Scott, um, Bob Bolander, um, Norm Bass, Ed Levy, and the other players on the team, we wanted Tall to win so badly. And that's one thing that you do find when you play internationally, that there's such a tight Team USA feeling. Everyone wants all the other teammates to win. So when one of the teammates suffers a tough loss like that, everyone kind of feels it. So those are never fun rides home on the airplane when you knew you were so close, but at the same time, it can be used as motivation when you get back to the training to say, Hey, if I'm in this situation and Tall's played at least five or 10 matches after that, where he took that experience and turned it around and came back from being down to zero or was up at the end and decided to close it out by playing slower. So, um, th those type of experience, um, they're very, again, near and dear to my heart because that's what makes you a good player. That's what makes you a good coach is having those tough experiences to make the better, the like the wins feel even better because you know what the losses feel like. Right. It's good to learn from them. But, mm -hmm. So what is your duty as a USA Table Tennis High Performance Director? So it's kind of an interesting job. Um, I guess back in October, um, Virginia Sung, who had just come on as the CEO, had asked me if I would be able to help out because um, a vacancy just occurred. And I said, I'll do anything to help USA Table Tennis, whatever you need me, need me to do. And she's like, well, there's an opening right now with the high performance director. Can you jump in and do the job? And I'm like, well, I did a similar job for US for Paralympics. So I, I know kind of what it entails. However, based on kind of the constraints that I had, I knew I couldn't travel that much and I didn't want to get into match coaching. That's a whole different mindset where you have to watch videos, talk to the players on a daily basis, um, make sure you develop strong relationships. You've got about 40 to 60 players on the national team. And I said, you know, I could see myself being a coordinator, a helper, but I'm going to need to build a team around me. And she's like, no problem, whatever you need, let's figure out. And so the first call I had was with Daniel Ruttenberg, who's just a wonderful individual from Texas. And he'd worked with the para program and I'd worked with him. So he came on as kind of like a team manager and he helped us out because we had the Olympic team trials against Canada in Chicago um, in a couple of weeks. Plus we were running a training camp in Westchester and a ranking tournament in Westchester the same weekend or the following weekend. So without Daniel's support, um, I don't know how we would have gotten through the month of October, but the men and women both beat Canada 3-0 and played exceptionally well. The training camp in Westchester with the Canadians went exceptionally well. The ranking tournaments went smoothly. And so Daniel was extremely helpful through the fall season. And then when January came around, um, we we're looking at options and Doru um, Gheorghe from Texas, um, who used to be the Olympic coach, um, he had expressed an interest to help out in any way, shape or form. So I asked him if he could help as the USAT team manager for the national team, dealing with all the stuff that I had been doing on the international front, which is entries um, for the national team, dealing with a ITTF has a stipend program for a couple of our players where they pay um, little scholarships and then also dealing with passports, visas. I mean, there's a lot of things that go on with sending our team internationally. And Doru expressed an interest in helping out. So I had to make kind of a, a little bit of a tough choice because Daniel had been so helpful. Doru brought a lot of experience and Doru could travel much more than I could. Daniel could travel also, but he had experience coaching the team 
and we always wanted to make sure that we had ample staffing when we send our team to different events. So Doro came on board. It's just been a real blessing to work with him because of his vast experience. Um, he has a great network internationally of ITTF coaches and officials at ITTF and the various countries. And that has allowed me to help be a little bit more strategic with Virginia and USA Table Tennis. We, we've just completed, I think it's week eight of our Thursday Night Live. And um, I've helped with kind of behind the scenes, both as a commentator and also setting up the hardware and the software to bring those matches live. Um, we're working with T2, which is a wonderful sponsor, um, setting in, sending in grants and working with the US Olympic Committee. The Olympic Committee has probably at least three to four hours of things you have to do every week, whether it's um, listening to US anti-doping, new regulations and requirements. We're all stuck in webinars and Zoom meetings all day long. So making sure we're up to date on the new drug code. Um, there's been a lot of um, inclusion and diversity as you've seen just within our society in general. And the US Olympic Committee is trying to be at the forefront to make sure that we look out for all athletes of all types and kinds. Um, the lockdown has given us an opportunity to do more interviews. And um, kind of like this one, I've been really fortunate to um, get a chance to interview some of my heroes. A lot of the Swedish players that were at the top of their game when I was coming up as a junior. We've interviewed um, Stellan Bengtsson, Michael Applegren, Jano V. Waldner, Ulf Carlsson, um, some of the ladies in Sweden. Um, so that's been a fun treat. So it seems like every week we have two or three projects that are going on. Um, I would anticipate because next month the World Singles Cup and we've got Canuck Ja, Lily Zhang, and um, Jennifer Wu have all been selected to play in that. So we're slowly getting back into the kind of the scheme of things from the international perspective, but just making sure that our players are staying active, practicing in a healthy and safe manner. Um, some California has been slower to come back than some of the others. Ohio has been very good. New York has been very good. Um, Maryland is still a little bit slow with um, the coaches not feeling so comfortable. Um, so really, I have a different hat on probably every three hours during the day. Um, there's a lot of things that based on my background, I can save some time. Um, the office staff from Mark Johnson, the COO, to Chad, who's our media person, to Tina, to Josh, to Yasna and Doru um, in Virginia. It's just a thrill to have so many people that love the sport want to get involved. We're trying a lot of regionalization right now where we're going to change how you qualify for the nationals. First in the junior levels, you'll have to be the state champ or win a regionals. You don't get to just throw your money down and go to nationals. You have to qualify because that's how it is in all real sports um, and giving clubs more support. Um, so I'm going to, I think there's going to be a lot of new changes, structural changes so that we can really grow instead of just having two big tournaments, doing a lot more at the local level and the regional level. And, um, that's where I get the most excited about because I think it's long overdue. Um, I know our coaches, Gao Jun, Stefan Feth, um, our coaching committee, PK, Franson. I mean, we've got great coaches. And as a high performance director, I just need to make sure that everyone's kind of on the same page. My job is not to be the super coach. It's not to say, oh, there's a match going on. Let me fly in like Superman and give the super tactics that's going to make the difference. It's more to make sure that the right coaches are selected, that the athletes are in a safe environment, that if there's issues concerning travel or um, eligibility or team selection or when we're going to have a tournament, that's kind of a little bit more where um, I'm supposed to be kind of the person who makes the final decision. Right. So um, as a USATT High Performance Director, what do you think of Team USA versus other countries in terms of advantages and disadvantages? So in the junior ranks, um, because of the great support of the parents and the our clubs have really improved light years ahead of when I was playing when I played we had no full-time clubs I mean a club in the U.S. during my generation was twice a week for three hours now to have a full-time club where you could train every day I mean I was training in my basement I mean that's where I had most of my hours the club situation has greatly improved the number of foreign coaches that have come over and called USA their home has dramatically raised the level. Um, still, you want to go where the competition is. And the ITTF 
with their junior tour. And I'm not 100% sure how that's going to work in 2021, if they're going to have junior bubbles or what they're going to do. Um, but the opportunities today are so amazing. Um, I would love to be a player today because I think I could bring up all that motivation and intensity that I had when we had so few opportunities and then take advantage of all the things going on. But to answer your question, our junior players can compete up till about the age of, I'd say 14, 15 on the boy side. And on the girl side, I mean, you look at Lily's results, you look at Rachel Sung, you look at Ariel Sheng, who has since retired. We've always had players that could compete. I mean, we've got two Olymp youth Olympic bronze medals with Canuck and with Lily. And that's a direct um, result of them making the national team and playing international on the adult team when they're still in their like post cadet, like age 14, 15. So we do a really good job. Our challenge is what happens once they finish high school? Do they go and play professionally? Well, Canuck has shown that that is possible and he's taken on huge responsibilities. He has a personal coach. He has personal sponsors. He's doing everything he can to be the absolute best person, but it's not easy. And we've had a number of other European and other US players going into Europe and you get homesick. The leagues are kind of just tough to do it day in or week in, week out for four or five years at a time. The pay isn't exceptional. You're not going to be making six figures. You're going to be making a lot less. If you go to college, you get a degree, you're starting, you're starting um, salary is going to be like 20 or 30,000 higher than if you were in the top 50 in the world. So it's not an easy decision to go pro. And I think if we can do more things like we did with Thursday night live, where everyone who played, I mean, um, we had Ved chef, he just won a thousand dollars. I mean, how many cadet, cadets are winning a thousand dollars from a USATT event? Um, next week, Aziz and, um, Rachel Sung will be fighting for the same thousand. If we can add a little bit more prize money to the nationals, maybe instead of playing for 10 to 15,000, imagine if they were playing for like 30 or 40,000 at the nationals. I think those type of opportunities would change the dynamics because ultimately we need to play in the US. That's where we're gonna have to be. We have to create an environment here where the best players come here. Maybe it's the older generation Europeans that have slowed down, that have the big names, the Jean-Michel saves. Maybe it's too late for those guys, but we need to have the competition. And um, just going abroad, I think it's just really taxiing on the US players mentally. And if we can create an environment here in the US where there's not just a league because we're so spread out, but regular competitions to where you have to beat um, Joe Shin, you have to beat G Way. I mean, you have to beat like good players to win it while you don't have to jump on an airplane and fly across the world. So for our kids, the opportunities are amazing. It will help you get into a better university. There's no question universities from the Ivy League to um, UC California, they all look favorably on table tennis. Um, NCTTA has a great program for colleges for them to play against each other. So. I think the opportunities are great for our kids. I would love to be a kid right now, um, but the rest of the world is also really strong. The Chinese are as focused as ever. Europe is a little bit on the, they, they weren't as strong as they were in the 90s and like 2000. Um, they're in a little bit of a resurgence. Um, Japan is really strong. Korea is always great. Um, so I think it's going to be tough for our kids. Um, we've got to focus on the Pan Am region because Brazil is really our biggest opponent and Argentina, Chile, they all, all complain. You can't forget about Canada. Um, they all have very good players. So for our juniors, they need to focus on the international as much as possible, get as much experience as possible. And then at the same time, if there's a way they can enjoy it, do maybe a little bit more off the table training. I think that that's one of our weaker areas and we've put in some grants to um, help solve some of those needs, but we'll see where it goes. Um, but I'm relying a lot on the personal coaches and then also the national coaches to help solve this problem. So were the players of Team USA still training during the pandemic? Yeah, most of them were, um, especially if they had siblings. I mean, you had Kai and his brother. Now, Kai, Kai Zarenbaum was in Europe and Aziz was back here, but you had Joanna Sung and her sister Rachel. Um, Lily Zhang was playing with Adi Gudwadi at ICC with Joe Shin and Nikhil. Um, Canuck was 
at this in this home in the states for a while. And then he went got back early and went through quarantine and got with his club in Germany. And Hugo Calderon is one of his teammates, so he's getting like just amazing training there um, in New York and New Jersey. Those clubs have been pretty active. Um, they've had to make sure they deal with the um, requirements of fewer players possible. Um, Westchester has done a good job. Ping Pod in um, New York, which is one of the new clubs, Spin did close down um, because it's like more of a sports, or not a sports, or more like a, a, a like a bar ping pong club together, and you can't have bars open, so that that was tough. Maryland has done a little bit more remote lessons um, where the coaches are doing Zoom sessions with the kids, and also we had, I would say, the first month. It was very active. We had a sports psychologist with Bob Swope. We also had a sports physio um, with Z- Zoran Docic from Croatia. And we were doing weekly training sessions with all the members of the national team. So we tried to keep them motivated. But then as the clubs began to open up, the kids kind of did their own thing. I know ICC ran summer camps. So um, things really didn't slow down because they were allowed to have kids um, go into a gym as long as it was only kids, that there was no parents. So I think overall, everyone got rusty, um, but I would say that most of the national team members are looking pretty good. And if you, if you watch the last Thursday Night Live between Joanna Sung and Ved Sheth, you can actually see they didn't, they looked pretty sharp. Whereas the first week, um, Tom Fang against Kai Jung, they were both like having trouble making their serve. So, I mean, uh, I think that everyone's kind of back to normal now. So I heard that uh, like there's a high chance that the U.S. Nationals and U.S. Open um, are not going to be played this year. So do you know anything about um, the World Championships in 2021 planned in Houston, Texas? Yeah, so right now um, the U.S. Championships, which was postponed to December, got repostponed to July. So it's got, we, we basically just lost a full year. So everything that was going to occur in December just got removed back to its original July. Um, with the World Championships, there was a lot of negotiations because the 2020 Worlds got postponed to 2021 in Korea. So the ITTF shoved everything. And when that occurred, then Houston was in the same boat because they had a lot of sports shoving forward that got missed to go into the slots because we were thinking of 2021 in Houston. And I believe the current situation is that USA Table Tennis is still looking to host the Worlds. Houston could be an option, but we're looking at different cities to possibly take on the World Championships because the bid was won by USA Table Tennis and Houston together. So the whole idea is if we could do that in New York and Los Angeles in one of the major cities, or if Houston were to figure out a way of getting those slot, the time slot back and available, I know that that could be an option. Um, I would love to see the world championships in the U S I mean, it's great for our players. It's great for our team. It's great for our fans, spectators. Um, but right now the ITTF is really focused on world table tennis. That's their newest venture. And they have a tournament coming up in Macau, um, at the end of, I think it's the end of, um, well, they have three tournaments. It's the World Singles Cup for men, or for women, then men, and then it's a ITTF Pro Tour Finals. And then right after that will be the World Table Tennis first pro stop in Macau. And I think that the ITTF has so many balls in the air right now. They're wanting to make sure that everything works out with the, this next bubble that they're going to do in China coming up next month. So I think we'll keep, if you're watching the USA Table Tennis website, as any new information comes up on world championships, it'll be posted there first. Um, but I know that Virginia and the rest of the team, they're still looking at options to host it here in the States. So um, we all know that safety is priority right now. But however, some players are against like wearing masks during training or playing. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think one of my close friends and one of our coaches, Samson Dabina, um, he experienced where some players were actually getting very dizzy and fatigued when they were trying to train with the masks on to where it almost became a safety issue on the other side where you do a, let's say a footwork drill and then you have to sit down because you can only do it for two minutes because you just can't take the oxygen in fast enough. So I think with proper distancing 
and making sure you stay on the same side and that you keep your ball separated from your opponents. I think there's enough distance, um, even though the table is nine feet away, and we know people sweat, we know people exhale and stuff comes out when they're hitting the balls. I think most of the time you're even probably closer to 10 to 12. I think we're pretty safe there. Um, so if a person's not wearing a mask, but they're definitely following all the other regulations. And again, I think in the club situation, making sure that only the people that are playing are in the club. There's no real need to have extra people milling around watching or doing things. Every table should have two players. They should be spaced out properly. And then maybe you have one person who's like manager at the door or something to make sure that the people coming in are the ones who've reserved tables. But I think that we're lucky in our sport. I mean, I wouldn't want to be playing basketball. I wouldn't want to be playing football. I wouldn't want to be doing wrestling because there you just, you violate that six to eight foot zone. Um, so if a person's not wearing a mask, but they're following all the other rules, I think we'll be okay. Definitely no doubles. Um, and again, if your tables are in the club, probably barriers between just for the ball issue so that balls aren't flying all over the place. Uh, thank you so much for coming on my show, Sean. It was a pleasure. Oh, it was definitely a pleasure. Good to see you again. And um, best of luck and um, stay safe and healthy. All right. All right. Have a good night. All right. Thanks so much.